Yeah, observation stops motion or the quantum zero effect. So it's an effect you all know. I mean, the car is passing by, and just by looking at the car, you can stop the car. <laughs> all it sounds not so trivial, but uh, indeed it's working. It's an old effect that was first described like 600 BC by Zeno of Elia. Elia is a town in Greece. So it's um, when Zeno went to school, the teacher was giving him some lessons on physics. So S equal V times t, so distance is velocity times the time. Zeno, of course, he wanted to, to check this, if it's really true. So he took his slingshot and tried to shoot a little stone onto his teacher. But while he was doing so, the teacher suddenly turned around and saw him. So Zeno, for sure, he stopped. He didn't want to, to shoot the teacher while he was watching. So there also the simple observation of Zeno stopped his motion. Well, this uh, might have been forgotten, but then a few, time, a few years later, while well, Zeno was hunting cats in his backyard, there he made a discovery that this is indeed true, so the velocity is always zero. Because what he had learned is, velocity is the distance delta s that is traveled in time delta t. So now at every instant of time, an object like this arrow is always at a well-defined position in space. For example, when you take this photo, during the exposure time, you can see the error is always at a well defined position. So now you take the delta s equal zero divided by the exposure time, what you get is zero. So motion cannot occur. Well, I see that you are not so convinced as I am. <laughs> so um, maybe I can do a little experiment. So I need someone on the stage. So maybe you with the friendly smile. Yeah, exactly you. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you can do the experiment with me, but unfortunately you're all refusing to come closer. But I can try to give you the experimental equipment. <laughs> yeah, and, and maybe I also have some for you. So, uh, yeah, thank you for coming up here. What's your name? Anton. Hi, Anton. So, um, well, what the experiment is, you know, this is a elastic. And you can try to shoot them at me. You, don't, you know in principle how it should work? <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's very good. Okay. So, <laughs> okay, and you all, of course, those who have their own elastic, you don't need to look at me, but the others, please look at him and the elastic, and when you observe it carefully, he will not be able to shoot it at me. So please try. One, two, look carefully, <laughs> three. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Somehow it seemed didn't work, but um, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, thank you for coming up here. Big applause for you. Well, um, to be honest, I tried several times before and never worked. <laughs> but indeed, it, it uh, occupied the scientists for about two and a half thousand years to find a solution to this problem. Why is motion possible? And then um, those two guys, Newton and Leibniz, they invented calculus and redefined the velocity. So they introduced the limit here for delta t to zero, and if you use the proper definition of velocity, everything works. So what can we learn from this? It's important to know your limits. <laughs> yeah. But then, um, I mean, I could stop now and say it's not working, but that would be too easy, so let's take something different. That's not like this elastic, so let's take another object something really, really different. And what that could be could be an electron, for example, so quantum mechanical object. To be more precise, the spin of the electron. So um, most of you studied some science, so who knows what a spin is? Well, that's quite good. <laughs> well, a spin is something like an arrow. It's, but it's a very special arrow, so it's an arrow that can point either to the left or to the right, nothing in between, so only left or right. And what we now want to do is to, to move the spin. So how can we move the spin? I mean, most of you knew what a spin is, so you should also know how to move it. Any ideas? Light is a good idea, but let's take microwave. So we have to put the spin into the microwave. Now what we do is we turn on the microwave. For sure, we don't look at the microwave while it's on, because we don't want to influence the emotion with, the, with our observation. And then when the microwave turns off, the spin spins. <laughs> So it's quite simple. Let's do it again. We prepare the spin, pointing to the right, turn on the microwave, not looking at that time, and 
when the microwave stops, the spindle point to the left. Okay, everybody understood this? It's not too complicated. Okay, so let's change the rule of the game a little bit. So now you can look once at the spin. So, for, so you turn on the microwave, then you move away with a nice cloud. You look at the spin, put the cloud there again, and then the question is, what will happen now? Will the spin be flipped? So point to the left or will it point to the right? And well, the answer is, it depends on the time when you are actually observing the spin. When you observe the spin, here at short times t, when um, the microwave didn't start to, to work, so before the microwave is turned on, you look at the spin, nothing happens, so the probability for the spin to point to the left side is unity after the experiment. Similar, when you look at the spin after the microwave already stopped, then you influence nothing, and the spin will point to the left with 100% probability. Interesting is the case when you look at the spin during the microwave operation, and there it depends, for example, when you look exactly in the middle of the microwave on time, then you can inhibit the, spin, the flip of the spin with 50% probability. So only in 50% of the cases, the spin will point to the left side. And this simply by observing it during the flip. So um, now we have everything together, we know what to do. We can go to the lab. Well, actually the problem is where to get a spin. So we need a diamond. There are little spins in. Actually not in the diamond itself, but in the, in the defect in the diamond lattice the so-called nitrogen vacancy center, consisting of a nitrogen impurity and adjacent vacancy, well, and together it's a nitrogen vacancy center. This is the most abundant impurity in the diamond lattice, so it's basically in any diamond. So you can just take the diamond you have, put it into the microwave, importantly <laughs> to read out the state of the spin to so to know if the arrow is pointing to left or right, you need a laser and shine it onto the diamond, and then you can do the experiment. Well, at least you can try to, but um, the problem is we couldn't get the funding for the diamond. So we <laughs> had to do something on our own. So we went to, to the workshop and asked them what they can do for us. And they had the idea to, to give us some tools that are diamond coated. That's already a good idea. If you look very close to those tools, for example with the electron microscope, you will see that there are very tiny diamonds on it. So like 100 nanometer sized diamond nanocrystals. And these also contain NB centers and are almost ideal for our experiments. So one problem now is that um, for the microwave, okay, we could get funding for the microwave, but the timer was not precise enough because you need pipes with a length of a few nanoseconds, and this a timer on our microwave didn't do. So we also had to build our own microwave. At the end, it looked like this in the lab. You can see a printed circuit board, which is to, to apply, which is basically a microwave antenna. In the middle of this uh, microwave antenna is a diamond, maybe you cannot see it because it's too small. And from below you have a microscope objective through which we can shine a laser onto the diamond to see if the spin is pointing to left or to right. And then um, we did the experiment. This actually took some time. So I could show you a movie, but it's like uh, 240 hours, so <laughs> 10 days. Fortunately, I had a master student at that time, so I didn't do the experiment myself. <laughs> and then, um, well, I didn't take a picture of the master student at the end, but what we took, we were taking the uh, experimental data, and they look not as nice as the theory I presented before, but what you can still see is that um, when you look at the spin before the microwave was turned on, nothing happens, more or less, and if you look in the middle of the microwave pulse, then the probability for a spin flip is highly reduced, and then if you look at later times, it's not that much reduced, but, well, if you, um, Look at the dot, at the dot, these are measured data, the solid line is a theory which perfectly fits into this, and the um, dashed line is a theory without quantum Zeno effect, so we can say, okay, there's a quantum Zeno effect, and in the quantum world, the ob observation of an object indeed changes its motion. Or, yeah, so what we were then thinking was um, about fancy applications in real life for this quantum Zeno effect. But, well, yeah, the problem was we couldn't find any, so maybe one of you had an idea. <laughs> and you can come to me and we can make something together. Yeah, and that's already the end, so what you should remember here is that quantum arrows don't fly when you are watching. So, thank you very much.